Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, let's be turning to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We come now this morning to Luke's account of the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is when he came in the flesh. Now, it's important that we take some time to think about and to, to recognize why our Savior came into the world. Why did he have to come into the world in this manner, born of a woman? Well, the Father had a purpose in sending his Son. The Father has a gracious purpose in the salvation of his people. He had a gracious purpose in sending his only begotten son, born of a woman, <clears throat> after the flesh. It says in John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He's got a people scattered throughout the world, and so to save them, to deliver them, he sent his only begotten Son. Because there, there was no other way of salvation. There's no salvation outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here that the Father's gracious purpose in sending his Son was to save a people, a chosen people, that he gave to Christ, his Son, as his beloved bride. And our Lord purposed to glorify the Son in the salvation of that chosen people. Because we would fall in sin. We fell in Adam. God knew this. He knew exactly what would happen, and he purposed that we should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of our souls. He purposed to save a people by Christ, to glorify the Son. He purposed to do this for his Son and for his people. And hence, our Lord is called in Scripture, in Revelation 13, 8, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. God purposed this. And he purposed this to accomplish our salvation. And to do that, his son would have to come and suffer and die. To suffer and die. Now, as the eternal son of God, he can neither suffer nor die. God doesn't suffer and God doesn't die. Therefore, he must be made like unto his brethren. He must take upon the weakness of this flesh upon himself. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We'll come back to Luke. In Hebrews chapter 2, we'll pick up in verse 14. <clears throat> For as much then... As the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He's talking about those that he loves. He speaks of those that he loves as his children. And as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That describes me, brethren. I was, I was made fearful. Fearful of, of, of God. I was made fearful because I began to see the Lord being gracious began to show me the wickedness and the filth of my works. That I was not righteous that my works were not pure and perfect and holy and just, that my way was the way of sin. And the Lord showed that to me. And he showed that to you, his people. He makes that known to his people that we are sinners. We might be religious, but we're sinners and we cannot save ourselves. And so 
we're made afraid because we're, we're always looking and thinking, have I done enough? Have I done enough? Was that last work good? Why am I thinking these thoughts now? I said I'd never do that again, and yet here I am doing the very same thing I said I'd never do again. And he shows, he shows his people that. That, we're, that in this flesh, this flesh is weak, it, it's sinful, it's ruined, it's corrupt. We are, we're, we're, we're dead in trespasses and sins, and so he must save us. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted, to, to care, to give aid to us that are tempted. He's able to do that. So Christ's birth is the account of him being born as a man, coming in the flesh. This is him, the Son of God's beginning. He's eternal. He has no beginning and no end of days. But as a man in the flesh like his brethren, this is when he was born. And he was made like unto us for the purpose that he should suffer for his people. To come and suffer for his people, as we see described in the Gospels. The punches that he took, the spitting that he bore. The, the mocking and the hatred and, and the despising that he endured for his people. And he went to the cross as the sin-bearing sacrifice of his people to make an atonement, to put away our sins, to obtain forgiveness of the Father for you that believe him, for you who have no righteousness of your own. That's why Christ came into the world and why he came in the manner that he came to die as the sin-bearing sacrifice to make satisfaction that we who are his people given to him should be delivered out of the hands of justice justly justly god being satisfied that our sins have been paid for and put away put away and he gives life in himself not only did he deliver us from death but he gives us life and light and understanding of the true and living God. And so this is the, the Savior that sinners need. He's the very Savior that sinners need. The righteous don't need him. The righteous, just like, the, just like the, the whole don't need a physician, but you that are sick need a physician. Well, you that are sinners, Christ is the Savior of sinners. He's the Savior of sinners. And as we go through Luke, we'll find that the people didn't expect him to come the way that he did. Certainly not the religious and certainly not the self-righteous. They didn't need that kind of savior. They didn't need that kind of salvation. They thought they were all right in themselves and their works were good. So the purpose of our Lord here in these verses, through the details that he gives us, are all leading us to understand that Christ came and died on purpose for people. He knew exactly what he was doing. This is exactly according to God's will and purpose for his people. Our Lord didn't leave anything to chance. He left nothing to chance. Nothing that depended upon you or I doing something just right in order to bring to pass all these other things. Nothing was left to chance. We'll see here this morning as we look at some of these details that our God brought to pass everything according to his word, just like he said. He brings to pass his promise, his purpose. And the reason for that is it gives us great peace and comfort to know that nothing is outside of the hands of our God. Nothing's outside of his control and power. And so that when he gives his word of promise, when you read a promise of God, you know he's keeping his word. He's kept his word. He's fulfilling everything he says to his people that he says he will do. Nothing shall fall short of that. You that believe him, rest in your Lord. Be glad. Rejoice. You're blessed. And you that doubt him and despise him, fear and tremble. Because he's bringing to pass everything that he said he will bring to pass. Just like he said he would do it. 
He's the God who's fulfilled his promise to us in sending his own darling son according as the prophet spoke. All right, so first, in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, we hear of the time in which Christ was born. He describes the time in which Christ was born. It says there, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Now, this is an, a, a significant portion of, of, this is a significant time. This is the time in which Christ was to be born. And there's two prophecies that were spoken hundreds of years before, hundreds of years before about when Christ would come. And this is the time when these prophecies are fulfilled in the coming of Christ. We're told that it would be in the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom would be in power when the Christ would come. And this is the fourth kingdom, which Daniel described as being strong as iron. Strong as iron. And that's how he described it in Daniel 2, verse 40. You can look it up later. And it's concerning that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which he didn't tell anybody about, but he said, you wise men, if you're so wise, you're going to tell me what I dreamed, and then you're going to tell me the interpretation of it. And I'll know that it's the interpretation because I'm not telling you the dream. You're going to tell it to me. And he was about to put all the wise men to death and the astrologers and the people seeking after various spirits, but the Lord gave the dream to Daniel. And Daniel came and interpreted to interpreted it to him. And Daniel said in Daniel 2, 43 and 44, Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave, they won't stick and stay together one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And what he's showing there is that Rome set up a, a, tr a tremendous kingdom. It was a tremendous kingdom that they had established in the earth at that time. There was Babylon and then the Medes and Persians and then the Greeks under Alexander the Great. And we see here Rome. And Rome did something kind of different in that they, they, they tried to push out their form of government and the way they saw the world and did things to the other nations that they conquered and tried to basically adopt them and bring them in as one with them, as, as one world governing power, one strong, one world governing power over the known or civilized world. That's why it says all the world, all the world, over that civilized known world at that time. And in the days, verse 44, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And that's true. Our Lord's kingdom is eternal. <laughs> kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. They come and they go. They seem great for a little bit of time and, and, and unstoppable until they're no more. They, they crumble in a day. They crumble in a day. But our Lord's kingdom is eternal. When he set it up, it's not failed. And he brings in people from every race, tongue, tribe, and nation, peoples scattered all over the earth, and, and our citizenship in heaven, in our Lord's kingdom, transcends our natural citizenship here on earth in the flesh. We love our brethren, regardless of their race, regardless of their nationality, regardless of who they are in their backgrounds. We don't care. By the grace of God, having a spirit, I don't care what your face is, your place, your race, your name, your riches, or lack thereof. It doesn't matter. We rejoice that Christ, my God, is your God. And we rejoice in that. And the Lord does that. That's, he breaks down that wall, that middle wall of partition, and brings together people who would otherwise never come together. It would be like clay and iron. Impossible. Man can't do it, but the Lord, he does do it, and he did. And so this was the time when Christ was to be born and set up his everlasting kingdom. Now, additionally, th there's another prophecy fulfilled, one by Jacob, 
father of Judah. And he gave his prophecy back there in Genesis 49.10. He said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until. Until. There's always going to be this rule by a king of Judah in the land. We're going to govern ourselves. The people will govern themselves until the time when Shiloh come. The peace and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And so here's this enrollment. That they went, all the people in Judah, they were enrolling themselves to be taxed because they were in subjection to this king. And at this time, what Caesar Augustus did is he appointed a king not from within, but from without. Even when Babylon ruled over them, they always had a puppet king that was of the lineage of Judah so that the people would take to it and, and be okay with it. But in this case, they put another king that was not a Jew, a king that was not of Judah and from without. And so this was the time that was spoken of, and this was the time when Christ would come. And the people were forced to pay tribute here. Now, brethren, the picture here for us is that we were created of God. We're God's creation. The true and living God created us in Adam for his glory, to worship him, to know him, to have fellowship with our God, the true and living God. But we were put into bondage. We were subjugated when we rebelled against the true and living God in Adam, in the garden there, and became subject to the prince of the power of the air. Now walk according, according to the flesh, walk according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the course of this world, naturally being spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. But Paul said in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, but when the fullness of the time was come, when God determined the time to be, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them, to purchase them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, being delivered from that family of death and ruin and brought into the family of God as adopted sons and daughters through the blood of Christ. And so our Lord ordained, we see he ordained this earthly kingdom of Rome. Right? God ordained it. This didn't happen outside of his control and he's all worried and wondering what's going to happen now and, and it, are his people going to be okay? No, he ordained the rise of Rome. He moved and instructed the hearts of these men who did what? They built roads. They set up security along those roads, improving trade and relations among nations all around their world. And man thought, this is wonderful, this is great. Look at, look at our technological advancements that we've accomplished by our wisdom and strength and might. They, they thought they were doing that, but we, what we see is God did this for the purpose, the sole purpose to send forth his glorious gospel along those roads paid for by the expense of the Roman government to send that gospel forth gloriously to the hearts of his people scattered to the ends of the earth. Because he said back in his word that Christ was the salvation of his people to the ends of the earth. So that seas couldn't get in the way, mountains couldn't get in the way, thieves and robbers can't get in the way, governments can't get in the way. His gospel goes forth gloriously. God did it for that purpose, to prosper the gospel. To, to reach his people wherever they are, whatever island they're on, <laughs> whatever wilderness they live in, whatever mountaintop or cave they're in, he'll find them. He finds them. His word will find them. His spirit will seek them out and bring them to himself. So we don't need to fear the workings of government. Right? The more we look at government, the more terrifying it is. And we think, what is going on? <laughs> These people are out of their minds. What's going on here? When you think about it, the Jews in their day, they were subjugated by Rome. They were conquered by Rome. And I'm sure they were thinking, what is happening here? What is going on? This is terrible. I'm sure some of them thought, 
I ain't signing up for this thing. I ain't going to do what he says. I'm not going to pay my taxes. And there were zealots in those days. Right? There were zealots that were fighting against the, the subjugating government at that time. And in that very day, when it seemed darkest and all was lost, that's the day that Christ was born. That's the day when he came into the earth as a man to obtain eternal redemption for his people. Listen to these encouraging words by the Apostle Peter, who said in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. <laughs> the grace that should come unto you, and you, and you, and all you, my brethren, who believe this day, they spoke of these things which should come to you, of God's grace. God's grace, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Right? We think of Daniel. Daniel prayed for weeks to understand what these things meant that he saw and heard. He prayed and begged God for weeks when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and of the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things, the thing, they administer the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. And, you know, so carnal man, he does things and he, he, he does purpose to hurt you. He's looking out for himself and to, to get what he's going to get at your expense he doesn't care about you. Carnal man does mean it for your hurt, but God has purposed it for your good. He's purposed it for your good and the salvation of his elect people. You know, we think about the invasion coming over the southern border with illegals, but there may be, <laughs> and I believe there is. He's got his elect people that were entrenched in darkness under the Catholic Church and under false religion and voodoo and who knows what they're, they're coming out of from all over the world coming up that southern border and I pray that he brings his elect under the sound of the gospel and they're called out of darkness because it's not for the sake of the others it's for the sake of his people when he's moving people around it's for the elect it's for the elect it's for their sakes for their good and so God's timing is always perfect and this is seen when we look at the birth of Christ. Let's see when we see his birth. Paul said to the Romans, Romans 5, 6, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And before he could die, he had to be born. That he was to come as a man to suffer and to die for his people according to the promise. And so it's to say to you, God's promises cannot, shall not, will not fail. It won't fail. It won't fail. He'll bring to pass exactly what he's promised to do, and that's a comfort to me. That should be a comfort to all of you. It should be a comfort. Now, not only was this time ordained of God, but so was the place of our Lord's birth. The place was ordained of God. God brought our Lord down to Bethlehem, that he be born in the city of David according to the prophet's word. That's what the prophet said. Mary and Joseph lived up in Nazareth of Galilee, of the Gentiles, far north, far away from Bethlehem. But the prophecy said, he's got to be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And so for that cause, for that cause, God put it into the heart of Caesar Augustus to finally bring to pass this, this decree that he had. Supposedly, I, I remember reading somewhere a long time ago that it, it was supposed to kick off a little earlier but it was delayed for some reason. <laughs> and here we see God delayed it. God delayed it for this time. And so he's, he decrees that there's going to be an enrollment for the taxation of all these people that are now under my rule. And it says in verses 3 through 5, And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. 
This is Luke chapter 2. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, <clears throat> out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so here's all these families being interrupted and moving about the country and having to pick up in, at a time when it really wasn't very convenient. And, and they're all going about being providentially moved by the hand of God for the purpose of bringing Joseph and Mary down to Bethlehem. God did that. It's extraordinary because God's making it known to you that he's in control of all things. He's doing this according to promise. Now he brings them to Bethlehem, and Bethlehem means house of bread. House of bread, and that's a fitting place for our Lord to be born, who is the bread of life, who came down from heaven, the bread of heaven, to feed his sheep. And we know that David, <coughs> David was born in Bethlehem. And David was a shepherd of his father's sheep. And then David became king. And when he became king, he didn't continue to rule in Bethlehem, but ultimately he, he went to the city of David, which is Jerusalem, which is the city of Zion, the city of Zion. And so our Savior is the son of David, according to the flesh, and therefore he also was born in Bethlehem, and he too is the shepherd of his sheep. You that believe him are his sheep, and he's the shepherd of his sheep. And having faithfully accomplished all the work that his father sent him to do, he now rules his people. He rules his people over that heavenly city, which is Zion, the city of Zion. As Peter said in Acts 5, 30 and 31, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And so Christ right now is king of kings and lord of lords. He won't rule in the future. He's ruling right now. He has the book in his hand and he's undoing the seals. He's, he's implementing the will of his father in the earth right now. And he rules at the right hand, from the right hand of the throne of his Father, implementing God's perfect, holy, righteous will, both in heaven and on earth. He's doing all things. He's conquering the hearts of his people and sending that gospel forth to, to, to deliver us from darkness and to bring us into his everlasting kingdom. Right now. Right now. But before that glory of his death for his people, we behold the pictures that we see of his grace and provision at his death. All right, verses 6 and 7, Luke 2, 6 and 7. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she, or Mary, should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And so the first place they go to is an inn in Bethlehem. Why would they go to an inn? Well, it's a picture. It shows us that our Savior, our Lord himself, is a soldier. He has no lasting home, no lasting city, no place to lay his head. But they went to the inn to seek temporary residence there, a temporary residence. But they found no room in the inn, and so they stayed in an animal stall where animals lie and animals feed. And animals go and are kept. And there she gave birth to Jesus. And she swaddled him in rags and laid him in a manger. A manger is that which, from which animals feed, <clears throat> even sheep. And so the Lord of glory, he humbled himself to take upon him the form of a servant, made like after his brethren, and comes in total poverty in order to redeem his people obtain eternal redemption for his people. Now, what this says to us is your time and my time. Our time and our place is very short. We're here but a vapor. You boys are young. 
it's going to go fast, very fast. We're here but a short, short time. And we that believe are strangers and pilgrims in this land. We're strangers and pilgrims. We're in, in, in this flesh here, this tent, it's temporary housing. It's temporary. This is not our lasting habitation. And we're told in Scripture, our Lord tells us faithfully that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. The judgment. And our Lord has told us in the scriptures is that we that are born after the seed of Adam, according to nature, are dead in trespasses and sins. We've offended holy God. We have a debt that we can't even come close to paying off. We don't have the righteousness. We don't have the works with which to, to muster up a payment to deliver ourselves out of the hands of justice. We can't do it. And there's a lot of people throughout the ages that have tried to work a righteousness for themselves. But he's shown us that all are under sin. The scriptures have, include, have concluded all are under sin, and so we're not going to deliver ourselves. In other words, we are poor, bankrupt, poverty-stricken sinners who have nothing to give to God, nothing to ransom our souls with, nothing to pay him who is holy, just, perfect, and righteous. But we have a good hope. And we have a word of good hope for the sinner. For you that are sinners, for you that are bankrupt and poor and have nothing, no righteousness, to recommend yourself to God and to deliver your souls, we have that good hope, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Father sent for his people to deliver them from death to deliver us justly out of the hands of justice and to give us an expected end in fellowship with our God, to know him, having life and light and liberty in our Savior, being delivered from these dead things that cannot save. And we're told, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich, rich in the things of God, rich in the things of, of the blessings of our God in Christ Jesus. He wouldn't have made himself poor if we weren't poor ourselves. And what he's communicating to us there, what he's telling us there, is that we are indeed destitute of good works and righteousness. It's not going to stand up before the all-seeing, all-knowing eye of God. Our righteousness is not going to stand before him. We'll be carried away in our sins and our unrighteousness is like a dead leaf, like a dead leaf. And so our Savior was born as a man in the flesh, born of a woman in extreme poverty and low in stature, because <laughs> that's what we are, because that's what we are. We are poor, bankrupt, ruined sinners in, in extreme poverty. And he fulfilled in that poverty, in that weakness, he fulfilled every jot and every tittle of the law, loving God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and his neighbor as himself, perfectly. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end, and then he went willingly to the cross to make a sacrifice, to make an atonement for the sins of his people by the death of himself. And so it says that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We look for him. And we rejoice because he's shown himself to us faithfully, graciously, kindly, and bringing salvation to our hearts and delivering us from death and darkness. And he did that by coming in the flesh. <laughs> in the flesh as a man born just like you and me, <clears throat> yet without sin was faithful in everything the Father gave him to do. So that's, that's our rejoicing. When we, when we think about our Lord being born at this time, that's what we think of. And that, that's, you know, when others talk about it, and, and, and some people say the silliest of things at this time, and, and focus on death, things that cannot save. But when you think of our Lord's birth, 
you remember why he came and you direct others of the, the good hope and the joy that you have that Christ did come because it shows us that our God is sovereign he's got everything in control and he accomplished redemption and I'm thankful for that so I, I pray the Lord bless our hearts with that word amen